Good morning. So there you see talking is Brad Larson, who was our first mechanical engineer and responsible for the original conception of the machine, what it looks like. And I've walked over here into the kitchen where I've got this board where I've printed all the different designs over the years. So this here was Brad's crazy first idea. And there was a few different renders of it there and there. And then it got refined a bit um, into that and that, uh, those legs down there. Uh, and these legs look great, but I thought they looked too much like the Keith van der Westen Mirage machine. So um, the original one had these crazy um, animal feet on rubber on them. So that got converted into these rubber pads fairly quickly. And, um, and back then we also, the original concept, this was just a, a holder, um, was to put a water tank on the side, which is what you can see here. And I love the asymmetric look, but in the end we found that it was just impossible to get this manufactured out of glass. Um, it also made the uptake assembly right here tremendously complicated. So we tried, I don't know, Brad, a year to try and make that glass thing work. Um, this was one of the later yeah. designs. It did have a lot of, um, it was more complicated than we thought. Yeah, it was so cool to have the asymmetry. Plus it was really nice to be able to fill it. Um, the other thing we liked about it is there was no way for the water to fall on the electronics, right? Since it's outside. Um, and, and in fact, we I lost you with that idea here and Hello? you can see it's it's still continuing uh -oh. it just won't go away this idea until eventually we gave up um and uh came up with the water tank under and then once that happened things went pretty quickly uh, does it still so it still has that ceramic tray under there yeah very much um, oh good yeah the ceramic tray sliding in here so, um, and still, well, actually, I just, I think yesterday, some, we were talking about uh, materials for the drip tray, because we're considering essentially like this crock pot material, which is ceramic sprayed onto a form. Uh, but early mm -hmm. on, we were really set on this idea of glass, and Pyrex was one of the things that came up as a suggestion on Diaspora. And if you've ever used like a lasagna baking tray, um, out of glass. There's a bunch of prototypes that use that. The problem is, is that we found that that is really a mass production item. You need to order 20,000 of them from the absolute start if you want to make Pyrex anything. And uh, that's a 10 year commitment. Back then it would be like a 30 year commitment on, on our quarry. Um, yeah. Also, I think um, we did buy some of those baking dishes and they kind of look like um, a baking dish. <laughs> yeah, like you put a lasagna there or something. <laughs> yeah, I think we were being mocked widely anyway for most of our design at the time. So the lasagna dish did not survive. Um, anyway, I thought I'd go over down memory lane. This is kind of cool over here. So welcome everyone. Uh, my intention on this call, as usual, is to um, cover a topic, but it is a Zoom call, it's not a lecture. And that means that you guys are welcome to interrupt. Um, what I've got next to me here, so these are machines that are completed, and I've got Ricky and Teddy doing calibrations. And then here, the machines, so these are done. They've been tested for any current leakings. That's uh, called a high pot test. Um, and Keith back there <laughs> uh, is <clears throat> um, testing steam and hot water and hot water calibration for each machine. So we're a little bit on a weird schedule this week because I'll show you. So this is a machine being built. Here's the group head, and there's a spacer right here made out of fiberglass. 
And so we, we're thermally isolating the group head two ways. This brass part here is actually what gets heated. This is the cartridge heater and hot water is coming in here and it's being flushed out here. Okay. And um, sorry, hot water is coming in here on the brown tube and coming out on the black tube. These are temperature sensors. So this temperature sensor is sensing right here, the water coming in. Okay. Um, and then we're sensing the metal temperature of this whole brass thing here. And this sensor here is lower than this one. And that is the one that goes all the way through the group head and measures the temperature right behind the shower screen. So almost the puck temperature. Anyway, this thing's hot. This thing's the temperature of your espresso. It's separated by a fiberglass piece right there that's green in order to keep this part from getting hot. And this is one of the secrets for uh, the reason that we're able to make espresso quickly on power up is that this part here where the water goes through is the only part you really need to heat up. We separate it with fiberglass here. There's still gonna be some heat leakage because the port filter does lock into this, into the bottom here. So there's some heat leakage, which is why we again have a thermal break here with some more fiberglass. And um, anyway, we ran out of that part <laughs> um, last week, which was annoying. It's one of those oversights because it doesn't actually have any circuits in it. We forgot to order it. Um, so we got an emergency order. So what, that's the reason we have all these machines here as well as these machines almost done because these machines got put on hold while we waited three days for the PCBs to arrive. So um, essentially the speeding up, in fact, that's today's blog post, um, we're on track to ship 200 machines this month and um, the best we've ever done is 87. That means that every system has to get better. Okay. You guys are welcome to ask questions. Um, you guys can hear me okay? I've tried to get far away from the steam. I can hear you yep. fine. Yep. I, I can't yep, feel. Good. Yeah. I'm going to turn my volume up. Okay. Um, so you guys absolutely can interrupt me and um, ask questions. So what I'm going to do is take a machine here and let's have a walkthrough. We're going to talk about, hopefully without the machine falling. Uh, in case those of you think that this machine has plastic, it has no plastic. It, it's 21 kilos in weight. It is metal. So despite the fact that it's small, um, it is, it's hefty. Um, this is metal, 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 metal. Everything's metal. Um, okay. So... Let's see, that's a little bit nicer. Let's walk through how water ends up making espresso. So first of all, here is our intake tube. This is how water comes in. And at the bottom of this intake tube is a little thimble, and I'll show you that to you in a little bit, that filters out particles, and that thimble can be pulled out and cleaned. Water there is measured, there's a second tube right behind it with this here. And this is measuring the level of the water and it measures it by measuring the pressure in this air column, okay? Different pressure there. And there's a little circuit board right there that does that with a wire that goes back to the computer. So if there's enough water, it gets sucked up here. Half of it goes to this pump, hot water, and then the other half goes to this pump, which is cold water. So they go through these two pumps and then come out through here. Okay. We used to have a flow meter here until version 1.4. We no longer do because um, our internal mathematics are more accurate than the flow meter we can purchase. Flow meters, because they're essentially windmills, um, are too slow to respond to quick changes. So they don't show things like channeling. It takes too much time. Can All we right. have the flow, new flow dameters down there below the... Uh, so there are no, there's no dampening. Um, in fact, we're kind of giving up on dampening because um, they just fail within an espresso, within a thousand years, a thousand. Oh, oh. We've given up on, sorry, not a thousand years. That would be fine. They fail within a thousand espressos. 
So we've bought um, German, Swiss, and Chinese knockoffs, and all of them fail. Um, and the way that they work is water goes into, actually, I've got one. Let me, I'll show you. I've got a machine here with the dampeners installed. And it's nice to get a, about 20 decibel drop in volume, but it's less nice to have them leak and not make coffee. So. Hey, Charles, are you on this call? I am, John. Okay, cool. So please feel free to add more. Charles knows way more about hardware than I do. It just happens that he's not in Hong Kong. Okay, so uh, this is a transparent machine in our kitchen, and it's got these dampeners on the pumps. Um, don't know which ones those are. Charles, do you know which ones are? Are those the knockoffs? Uh, those are the Jura ones. Yeah, they're kind of nice. Yeah, the, uh, the ones they made for Jura. Yeah. So what we did is we bought spare parts. We're not supposed to. Um, but we, we claim to own different people's espresso machines and bought their parts to in order to buy this. There's a few um, Swiss and German espresso machines, home machines, that use vibration pumps, but they use them at full pressure. Um, so they really go, ah, it's a really ugly sound, and that wouldn't sell. So we never sound like that because we never run our pumps at full, right? Ours go, kind of thing. <clears throat> and we have two. So those machines have installed these dampeners. What a dampener is, is essentially imagine a Frisbee, okay, with a piece of flexible rubber inside. And what happens is water goes in and then pushes in, fills more space. And then as the, the, the uh, pressure wave stops, the rubber pushes back. So it essentially ends up smoothing out each of the pulses. And um, it turns out that a lot of the noise that you hear in our machine is the pressure wave from the pump going through the machine. So if you take these pumps and you just suspend them in air, the uh, volume of the machine goes down. But since I've got this machine right here, this is one of the downsides to making a machine really solid is that uh, here's the inside of the machine is the pressure waves are coming in here. This is, and I'll talk about this in a few minutes, but this is where water mixing happens. So you've got a pressure wave that comes in and basically shock goes through, which is what causes sound. Um, we have tried a bunch of different dampeners um, and they just start to leak. And in fact, if you go online, you'll find that the reason they're widely available as a part you can buy is because they're widely failing for people. And my feeling is if you can't do better than say Siemens uh, or Jura, those are serious German Swiss companies with big R&D budgets. I don't know that we're gonna make this part more reliable than them. Uh, so uh, you can buy the thing. And I think they're what, $8 or something like that, Charles? They're less than 15. Yeah, about eight bucks. They're, these, are the two, these are the two different kinds. Uh, this is the Siemens one, which is horizontal. And this is the vertical one that you see in John's machine there that, that he was just showing us, which is the Duro one. Th these actually work pretty good and they're, they're reliable, but they're much more expensive and they're su super hard to find. Uh, they have very good NDAs with their uh, manufacturing companies. And these, uh, if you can see the, the edge of this, um, it's just a pressed metal plate with a rubber membrane underneath it. And when they fail, this plate just blows off. It's very loud. Uh, it usually puts a dent in the machine because of how they're positioned, and it's very exciting in the moment. So it's not uh, it's not that fun. Me, Ben, and I have both experienced it. So that's why we're not uh, going down with that. Um, we thought about inventing something, but you know, there's a lot to invent in the world, and um, so no, um, we have been trying to switch to a new pump manufacturer. But, oh my God, uh, sorry if there are any Italians on the call, but wow, that <laughs> country needs to get more friendly with the rest of the planet. Um, it's so hard to work with those manufacturers. I think they're used to just working with the same Italian manufacturers who are in the same city. Um, and I think we've been a year just getting samples, getting specs. Um, it's, it's, it's just impossible. Um, 
And in the end, we thought, okay, if we switch to using this pump, we have a completely unreliable supply chain because, I mean, like you email and it takes three months to get an email back. Uh, and, uh, or you, you hire an Italian guy to go visit them and, and then there's a new person there. So, uh, I mean, the pumps we have now are made by ODE, which is an Italian company, but they are global and um, they have a really large engineering office here in Hong Kong and they work, they don't break down. Uh, we can go visit them. You know, the machines, the espresso machines getting made. Uh, switching to a new pump manufacturer who is already super flaky. Uh, and bear in mind, the problem is, is that we're making a really expensive machine with a pump that they see going out to Nespresso machines. So we're a really small client to them and, and they don't seem to um, have a problem letting us know that. John, quick question, yeah. if you don't mind. Um, can you talk about why, as far as I can tell, the two pumps are in parallel, is that right? So they're both running at the same time? Yeah, so each, um, the way that the machine works is instead of connecting the AC line directly to the pump, which is how an espresso machine would work, right? And then you buy a pump that has the flow characteristics that you want. Our pumps are over spec <clears throat> They go to 19 bar and the flow rates are much higher than we need. And instead what we do is we take the AC line and we detect the zero crossing and then we have individual pulses of AC that we can control. We then send individual AC pulses to either the hot pump or the cold pump so that Let's rotate this. Okay, so let's go to the next step and I'll, I'll explain what's going on. So the hot pump and the cold pump are going into these two structures. Now these are made of ultim, they're rectangles with a bunch of holes and there's two of them stacked on top of each other and we refer to these respectively as the aux manifold, auxiliary manifold and mix manifold. Basically what's happening here is water mixing. So we're mixing hot water and cold water in these in this thing, okay? And, uh, and there's temperature sensors, both measuring the in and a temperature sensor for out. Um, so that's what's happening there. So the reason we control the individual AC pulses is that when we're trying to achieve a certain temperature um, and the temperature is measured in here. So here is, see this brown tube here? This is water going to espresso. Um, so this is water going to espresso here, and we measure the temperature that we want initially here before the espresso starts, and then when the espresso starts, we measure it here inside, right, with that probe I showed you. So if we notice that the water is too hot or too cold, we, uh, we do one more cycle more, or a few more cycles, of the hot pump or the cold pump to affect the mix here. And that's why these tubes, these tubes here are only 1.2 millimeters in internal diameter. So there's very little water in here. So even though that seems like there's a fair amount of tubing, um, there's not much water going on there. Did that answer your question? I think so, yeah. I mean, so it's, it's basically one is hot and one is cold. That's exactly and right. you're running those at different cycles to get the mix that you want. Exactly. And that's why hey, John. it's going because there's each one is getting individual pulses to give us the exact water form we want. And in order for that to work, we have to have a physics model of how much water will get moved by each pump pulse, um, which is also why we don't have flow meters anymore because we had to have a really good model in order to water mix it. Hey, John, quick question. This is Corey. Um, it's actually two parts. First one, still on the pumps and how they work. Uh, a while ago, I thought I remember hearing about different voltages that you fed into the machine affecting the calibration of the pumps. And if you had a 110 volt outlet versus a 120 volt outlet, it would affect how much water is actually pumped. Is that still an issue? Do you have circuitry that accounts for that? Or what, what, what's with that? Because I haven't seen it in a while. Uh, that is um, endemic to vibratory pumps. Essentially, the way a vibratory pump works is it has a big electromagnet. That's what this black body is. And the electromagnet <clears throat> is, has a piston and a piece of metal on it. And when it engages, it pulls like this back and forth. Okay. And uh, when you have no pressure, 
a all these pumps operate the same, right? Each because the pump stroke is a full pump stroke. As you approach higher pressures, that electromagnet has to fight the water pressure more because there is now nine bar right here at this outlet. Right? So water's coming in, and this electromagnet is pushing a piston against this. <clears throat> These pumps are stacked between 100 volts and 100 and I think 30 volts. Uh, and there's also 200 to 250 volts, I think our other model is. Uh, and so as you go up in pressure, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 bar, the more voltage you have, the more powerful this electromagnet can be and the more water it can move at high pressures. So essentially there's a curve that shows you, it's actually like this, um, which is the amount of water per pressure. And if you have um, a really powerful pump, it's gonna look more like this, which is to say, as your pressure increases, you're still moving a fair amount of water. If you're on uh, 100 volts, it's going to drop off much faster. So um, that's what we're doing now. Actually, I'll show you. This is right here. This machine here can give us any voltage we want, uh, as well as any frequency. And we, we've got two of them. And um, <clears throat> this is something we did yesterday before they're doing any tests is that we fed every machine a very precise voltage and then we record in the firmware what the voltage was. Then the firmware then uh, sends electricity to the heater and measures how much current the heater is using. With all that information, when this machine now goes to your house, <clears throat> the firmware can look and say, okay, let me put full power onto the heater. How much is this heater consuming? Okay, I now know the voltage at your house. Oh. So, um, so that's why we calibrate the machines with a very specific, um, uh, well, with a, with a known voltage and then type that into the firmware. So uh, now, we're not yet using that. Um, so the mathematics hasn't been adapted yet. Okay, so we know we can use the mathematics, it's just that that's a bunch of physics work and we haven't done it yet. So over the next year, we uh, should be able to, but I wanna add one more piece of complicated information, which is um, power in a house does change, not just seasonally, which is exciting, but also based on uh, what you're drawing. So if you're steaming or you're particularly heating the water higher, they're gonna, those heaters are going to draw more electricity, which might mean less electricity available for the pump, okay? And which is going to affect the algorithm. Now, what you can see, let me show you here. Let's the machine over. We've planned basically five years of software development for this machine. So it's gonna keep getting better for you. What I wanna show you is, here, no, you really can't see it. Okay, well, ah, there you can. Right there is a coil. And in fact, I can grab an AC board. But if you've ever seen an electrician come in, they have these big clamps. The clamp is an electromagnet with a wire going through it. And essentially, as current goes through, it induces um, current in that coil, which you can measure. That's a fancy way of saying that we can measure current draw on the machine. So if we know how much electricity you have when it's not doing anything, and we go through a clamp, then as the machine is running, we know constantly how much electricity we're actually sending to the pumps. And with that information, we can adjust the physics model. Okay. Uh, if it all sounds quite complicated and a lot of basic research, it is. Uh, nothing, there's no machine that does anything like this. Uh, in fact, it's almost no machine on the planet, professional, um, display flow rate, period. Because, um, I mean, even the MENA, that's a flow metering machine, doesn't actually tell you the flow rate they're actually delivering because it's hard. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's really cool that you put these things in the machine that you aren't even using yet just because you haven't gotten to being able to use it yet, but you're able to just with a software update. Yes, yeah, so that like was actually five years. in one one. Um, so, I, so only the 1.0 users, the 280 of those machines, don't have that. But otherwise, the circuit board 
has not changed in version one, one. Everyone has the same thing. One one also has the necessary circuit for the GHC. Um, so uh, yeah, what we what you know from the very beginning we went with the assumption that we didn't know what we would want in the future. So the reason this machine is quite expensive is that we worked backwards. We said, what might we want to be able to do in the future? Let's build that all in so that we can add it over time. As opposed to a conventional appliance, which says, what are the features unchanging? And how can we build a machine as cheaply as possible to do that unchanging feature set? Uh, that's why the espresso machine gets new and better features all the time, you know, like steam profiling. Why is it we can do that? three years into the line, uh, because we planned for it way long ago. One question. Uh, two questions. The, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had the floor. Uh, on the on the removal of the flow meter, like is the firmware just ignoring the, the flow meter on older machines now, or is that still being used? So the flow meter was never actually used. The flow meter was something that we put in the machine on the assumption that we would eventually want to use it, at, at the very least, to calibrate. Uh, and, and so it was never, there was never a firmware that ever used the flow meter. The only thing we had to change in the firmware is the flow meter was slightly impeding the flow because it, you know, it adds friction. And so we had to just change the physics model slightly when we moved the flow meter to indicate it's not there anymore. So you guys get slightly higher flow by removing the flow meter. Um, it wasn't an expensive part. I mean, we're talking about less than three U.S. dollars. It's just so just from, from a philosophy perspective, that seems like a really big thing to do because it's kind of like the whole machine is built on this idea of a closed loop, you know, yeah. where you're both doing things and measuring it and adapting based on reality. And then you switched for flow to basically an open loop where you're saying, I can predict what's going to happen. And so that must have been a real debate there. Um, oh. It, it, it was, and that's why it took years. You know, it took we for four years. We had that appendix in there that was not needed. And yeah, go ahead. Sorry, the 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 debate. It was easy to end the debate, Nick, in because there are no accurate flow meters. The the accuracy is like plus or minus fifteen percent. So that's a thirty percent range. And it's just it, the machines, when we were using them with the flow meters and looking at what we we're seeing, it was just all over the map. The, the physics model is usually within two to five um, total. So, you know, two, two to three plus or minus. So it's much, much more accurate uh, than the flow meter ever was. And if they made better flow meters, and they do, and they, that they're huge and they cost thousands of dollars. So it's not uh, feasible. They're also that not data. fast enough. If we want to do fast water mixing, yeah. which we want to, we would have to put a flow meter on the hot water line and the cold water line and have them be really quick responding. And um, nothing is as, as quick responding as actually counting pump strokes. Yeah. Bad data is worse than no data. <laughs> so that got removed. Also, um, in the, the normal flow meters you find in all machines, let's say a GS3 is really the same thing as we, we have. Um, we actually have a Chinese knockoff of the ODE flow meter. We start off with the ODE flow meter, but, um, which is what you find in La Marzocco. And then these Chinese guys came, and it was a much nicer flow meter, just picking it up. The plastic quality, the tolerances. Um, instead of the veins being like this, they had them like that. And I, I got all this time with the engineer explain to me why, and they said, well, we got from 95% accuracy to 98% accuracy. But bear in mind, that's with a flow rate of six mil per second, which is great for pre-infusion or for their main application, which is water fountains and water dispensing, right? That's the main application for flow meters. It's not coffee machines. And coffee machines with their variable flow rates um, don't really have a dedicated part. The other world of flow meters is medical. Uh, dialysis machines and such, and those machine those flow meters are easily damaged. They're expensive, and they're still um, high latency. They're still slow to respond. So we think this model is the best we're going to get. Um, the worst we've seen in terms of accuracy is forty percent off, but that's with someone who's on a two hundred forty five volt line. So we know why. And we think over the next year, we'll really nail it. I mean, some people like Ben and Shin, uh, Australia and Korea, I mean, they're like, their lines are exact 
at every voltage. It, it's, it's stunning. Every uh, pressure, sorry. Can I, can I ask why? Because I think you're referring to my... Um, yeah. Yeah, so we're pretty sure that your... Uh, so the, these um, pumps are calibrated to 230 volts. And the more you deviate from 230 volts, the more incorrect our model becomes. And we, we should be able to solve that. John? I'd like to understand the theory behind that because if I run my machine on 230 volts, my inaccuracy is greater. I don't know. I, I don't know why that would be. Um, I, but let me put it a different way. Um, our plan is to let you adjust the calibrated voltage for your house. So we'll set it to something. Um, but once we have the physics model taking voltage into account, there'll be a GUI setting where you can slide it. So if you find that um, we're currently understating your flow, uh, in other words, we say we're flowing less than you actually are, you'll be able to increase your voltage and hopefully make the curves match up. So if you have a scale, which I believe you do, um, we should get to a point where a calibration screen makes the scale and the internal flow model match. Right, I understand that, and I've um, I've made my own calibration, um, but okay. I can only I can only um, record it like on the tablet, so I can't feed that information back to the um, to the machine to react on on that flow. Did you reading do the a calibration calibration? curve of pressure versus flow? Yeah, it's a logarithmic curve. But what I feel is happening is, um, like you explained before, the more uh, back pressure on the pump, um, the less or the more affects the power of the pump. So the flow decreases with uh, more back pressure. Now, once once I get that pump to about nine bar, uh, the maximum flow I can get out of my machine is um, is, is around two mils per second. Mm -hmm. um, if I try and um, make the machine flow faster, it, it just stalls. The flow rate stalls around that two mil per second. So I can't actually get two and a half mil per second flow in my bar. Um, and that's where the, the accuracy really starts, um, or, or the uh, inaccuracy increases. So if I'm, if I'm trying to get two and a half mil, three mil um, at, at eight and a half bar, my flow rate's gonna show 50% um, greater than the actual flow coming out. Yeah, I don't know why, I mean, maybe Charles can comment on this. I don't know why your accuracy is going the other way. Um, I guess I would just say that your voltage is not one we're currently modeling. Uh, and I don't know what the pumps are doing um, in your case. Charles, do you have any comment? Uh, it makes me wonder about the AC board. Damien, is it is it 40% high or low? Low, right? Um, my actual flow is lower than what's been reported. So yeah. um, it would appear to me that um, the pump is stalling the machines. Uh, the firmware is suggesting that the flow is coming out, um, but the pump isn't producing the power to push the water that the firmware thinks it's pushing. Um, and that one, one of the ideas I had was maybe to be able to run pumps in parallel, share the load. Um, so if you had four pumps in the machine, for instance, we could um, uh, produce a higher flow at the same pressure because you, you're basically doubling the, the um, magnetic power of the pump or the piston power of the pump. Yep, that's um, correct. Yeah, I don't know. We do have some other pumps. So we have some pumps that, that ODE makes for the Korean market and they have different curves. So uh, that might be something that we is worth trying in your machine uh, <clears throat> because it's, it's again, I, I, your, your voltage is not one that we're testing for. So you're on the edges of what we know about. Uh, no, you're actually beyond the edge um, of what we know about. <clears throat> but it's great to hear that at least you have a logarithmic curve that is able to correct what we report so that it matches the scale. Um, that, <clears throat> I guess I'd have two goals with your machine, Damien. One is to at least report correctly what's happening at 245 volts. And then secondly, to see if we can get more flow out of it, uh, which we might be able to do with a different pump. John? Yep. Hey, it's Alex Sagan. Hi. Um, while we've got the open machine, um, is there anything else you want to show us about
plumbing or circuitry or, you know, a lot of us don't have a see-through machine and are hoping we won't have a reason to, to take the skin off. So, yep. Um, I guess one thing is I, I really want to emphasize is that um, all the tubing is solid Teflon. And <clears throat> the reason we use solid Teflon is because when pressure goes through it, it doesn't expand or contract. A lot of tubing does. Um, that the expanding contracting tubing is something a lot of Nespresso machines do. In fact, as a pressure damper, right? If you've got silicon tubing, then as pressure goes up, it expands, it decreases, it does this, and that actually smooths the flow, um, which is cool. We experimented with that, but it also gives you kind of random flow. It's very hard to know what's going on. So we went with solid Teflon. Uh, solid Teflon also doesn't flake. It isn't like a Teflon frying pan. <clears throat> it's also thermally stable. Uh, it doesn't actually have, uh, it doesn't reach any heat out. So that's why we use these instead of metal. So a lot of pro machines will use metal and welded connectors. And the reason they do that is <clears throat> that uh, they're very long lasting. However, metal connectors, metal tubing will suck a lot of heat out of the water, which we don't want. We want the temperature here to end up being temperature here. So these are all solid Teflon. And the other thing I love about these is that uh, professional machines that use metal, especially with welds, but even the, the two main connectors, one is, is wenched down with a bolt and the other is welded. Um, they're both very simple to thermal cycling. This metal contracts and expands as it heats and cools. And that's an extremely common problem with metal tubing inside a machine. These connectors were invented by Nestle. They are not patented and they are copied, but they're not really an open market thing. Uh, they're not an open standard. <clears throat> but what's really cool about them is this little pin that's here. Sideways, so you can see it. There's this little paper clip here, okay? And if I pull on that, and just be fair tweezers, it'll pull and this tube will come right out. And let's see. I'm gonna get a pair of tweezers. Sorry for the pause. Um, so these really, really rarely leak, but nonetheless, I pull that out like so. Okay, and there it is. And it's just essentially a little paper clip with a bend. And this bend is gonna go around the tube. So I'm gonna have to fix this machine afterwards. But if you wanna take your steam wand out, so this is what this looks like. So it's solid tubing, a piece of brass here that's at a very precise location. And then an inner sleeve here that essentially pushes against the brass. It goes all the way to there. So that when this goes in, essentially under pressure, it just locks. Okay. Now inside there, I can get a pair of tweezers out, but there is an, a little rubber o-ring, it's silicon, that goes on that end. And to mount this tube back in, you just push it back in like so, okay, and then push this clip back in here. Okay, you can't see, my fingers are there. Um, and the nice thing about this is this is self-sealing. So once there's no pressure, these things actually, these all move. Uh, so we don't have the problem with thermal cycling that every other machine has because pressure is released, it cools, these things move, pressure goes up, it goes up, it seals again. The only problem we'll have is that the O-rings that go on the end of these are made of silicone and if you use tweezers that are slightly sharp, you can just scratch them and then they can leak. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, but once they're in, they don't. So that's something that happens, maybe I'd say two or three machines out of 50, somewhere there'll be an O-ring that leaks and you pull the thing out, put a new one in, pump it in and there we go. So that's the machine there. And what we've done is we've standardized that connector everywhere. So this, for example, steam wand has a totally different fitting. We buy the steam wand, they make it for other companies, but we have made a metal adapter so that we can use this clip connector on it. Uh, someone asked, I think it was actually Corey, you said you're gonna ask me questions uh, of things I haven't posted and what's happening in the next version. So 142 is the next version we're planning. Uh, 14 is the version we're currently shipping. 
we're not changing anything uh, of substance. We're making um, a year's worth, so 2,000 machines of 1.4. We're calling it 1.4.2. One of the small things we're doing is we're having the company that makes the Steam One, now that we're big enough, machine this end directly on the end of the Steam One. So we don't have to have an additional part and it takes a little less space. Um, so that's the kind of thing we're doing. Um, there's some other things where, for example, here where the tubes go, there's a cutout. We're gonna make that cutout about a centimeter larger. So it's a little more roomy to go through. Um, it's all kind of on that level of tweaking. Uh, it's feedback from the assembly crew or from Charles with repairs, things we could do to the sheet metal to make things easier to repair is what we're working on. But looking at the top of the machine, this is where water mixing happens. And this yellow green tube here goes, and this is the entry point, what we call the main manifold, which is where water then gets directed somewhere. So the temperature is registered. Underneath here is a pressure sensor. Okay. And then if we like what's going on, then it goes to copy or it goes to make key. Okay. Um, and the steam comes right off the steam heater so it doesn't go through the manifold. This material here is ultim, which you see right here. It's amber colored or sometimes black colored. It is a uh, medical quality, medical grade resin that we like a lot because um, it's used in dialysis machines, it's used in in-body transplants, it does not leach. It's really safe stuff. Okay, let me flip the machine over. Hey, John. Yo. While you have that uh, up there, you should show off the new uh, PSU and bracket. Yeah, uh, if I thought it closed. But I'll go, to, I'll go to the machine right next to me that has them being built. There you go. <clears throat> All right. So these are machines being built, okay? <clears throat> and in the one three machines, the uh, these are circuit boards right here. And in the one three and OE machines, we had a power supply here. This is DC power supply, which is this thing here. This thing has gotten bigger. It used to be about that tall, and it used to go there. Now it doesn't fit because we've gone to this newer 60 watt uh, model. So that's a sealed power supply made by Meanwell. These are great. And this is now on one big board. So those of you who are thinking about getting the upgrade from 1.3 to 1.4, this is what you're gonna get. You're gonna get this board, the power supply. Um, Charles, do we send them this or do we just take the one off? The relay is the same. We, we can use the same relay. Okay. So we're gonna make a video about how to <clears throat> take this panel off and put the new power supply in. And what that will get you, and again, the firmware is not yet doing it, is background refilling and constant tablet charging. So the power supply that we used in 1.3 and earlier was 35 watts. It was the most powerful mean mill made. Since then, they've come out with the 60 watt model, so we're able to move to it. The 35 watt model allowed us to make espresso, do all the stuff we need to do, <clears throat> but there was just yeah, maybe not enough power to make espresso and charge the tablet. Um, so that's why tablet charging turns us off on all one, three and order machines while you make coffee, while you make steam. Um, How did you find space for anything bigger? Uh, it's really tight back there. It's always a Tetris game. And actually it was Charles who uh, invented that bracket. Yeah. I, I should have known. Yeah, I, I, um, I just, I fiddled, I was uh, looking at something one day and it just popped into my head and I said, we can fit this. I looked at the dimensions and I said, we can fit it. And I just worked something up real quick and then I, um, I texted Ben and, and the bracket almost as it is now was, was born in probably 20 minutes. But it's, it was just a small, it's such a small location where it can fit that it didn't really seem possible, but it, it uh, it's just able to fit. And it's fortunate it's because that was the casing size, so. It's a Rubik's Cube now, right? Get everything yeah. in there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> One quick question before we move on from the manifold. It, it looked like um, 
maybe the manifold is like a source of of problems as far as leaking goes. Is that right? Um, in that there were like maybe they were being over tightened or something like that. Is that, yeah, am I remembering that right? This is the newer model. Okay, <clears throat> and this stuff is is a resin, and these bolts here are bolting um, valves on and also to the chassis. And then these two things here, until recently, had four bolts on them. Okay, and then the other side, I'm gonna, I'll grab one actually. It, uh, guys, while while he's grabbing the other one, you can. This is the first model. It's kind of translucent. You see, there's a long insert here. This is the mixing chamber. There's a long white insert, and then on this cap side, there's a short end. In this short end between these two sensors. There's the pressed-in orifice. Um, Altem is fantastic in all the regards that we're looking for. It's an excellent insulator. It doesn't transfer a lot of heat. It doesn't leach. Um, and it's super stiff, so it doesn't uh, give us any trouble with um, giving us bad values for flow or, or changing any of the values. The one issue that we ran into um, is that the pressed in orifices, they need a very, very finely calibrated hole. And sometimes even just the tooling marks from the drill, if they're not drilled just at the right speed, you know, manufacturers rush sometimes. And if they overheat the Altem or if they leave a scoring mark in it from the tooling or even a small bit of the Altem that's being drilled out gets wrapped around the drill bit and it, it hones out the hole unevenly. When we press in the orifice, and it, it can also be on our end, if we press the orifice in too quickly, it can create tiny micro fissures in the Altem. Over time, those micro fissures, especially with temperature cycling, can propagate. Uh, we move to a different material. You can see the difference in the translucency on the model that John has on the table there. Uh, it's nearly opaque. Uh, that's because there's 30% glass fiber incorporated into it to make it stiffer. Um, but the, the trouble was, was that in one chamber where we have high heat cycling, it was still finding a way to propagate a crack uh, from the pressed in orifice to one of the bolt holes. And then once it reaches the surface, it, it, it just spreads out all over the place. Um, we identified it pretty quickly, uh, but we had to find a solution, which is why you can see there's two holes now instead of four, and why they're much smaller, and I'll, I'll let John take it from there. That's pretty much what I was going to say, is, so just a bit of history, the 1.0 machines were clear, they didn't have any glass reinforcement. Um, within about a week of each other, two cafes that were using the B1 Plus model, both had uh, this part right here, right here, crack, okay? And that was due to heat cycling, we're pretty sure. Both of them had a real discipline of flushing after every shot, so hot water, cold water, hot water, cold water. So they cracked. We did two things at that point, this is four years ago. Uh, we made this part thicker here where the clip goes, and then we also switched to reinforced material. Um, yeah. And uh, and then uh, that's Cafe Frama, and I thought it was Simple Cafe. Um, both had that problem. And, and uh, the Highline as well. Highline, right. Mark, and, uh, yeah. Since then, no problem, right? Since then, their their manifolds have held uh, and they make a lot of coffee uh, off, off the machine. Um, so that was the crack there. We thought we had nailed it. Um, we aren't, you know, the, one of the problems is when a problem happens a year later or three months later, you you have to kind of figure out, okay, why and why is it happening, right? So right now it's happened in about 4% of our 1.3 machines. It's not happened in any of the 1.1 machines that I know of, uh, this crack propagation. We did switch right. manufacturers. So um, the new manufacturer for 1.4 um, is not who we use for 1.3 and the material is a little bit different. <clears throat> um, we have a couple of theories. One is uh, it might be that these were over tightened. So coming back here, we had four bolts, and the bolts did mount to the backside of the altar. And so it's possible that the bolt being there, as you tightened it, um, actually strained the material quite a bit. So one of the things we've changed is all the new machines have a piece of metal here, a mounting uh, bracket, and then the bolts then 
mount onto the mounting bracket, which then distributes the load over the whole thing rather than there. Um, we've also standardized everything in terms of fork screwdrivers. Those used to be hand screwed. And um, so now they're low torque screwed onto a mounting panel. The holes on these are now smaller and there's only two of them instead of four. Uh, so, uh, but we won't know for a year, right? If the problem is really lit. But those, uh, yeah, those holes, those holes are also important. Uh, when I showed you before, the mm -hmm. long mixing insert and that being where the uh, calibrated orifices are, where the cracks would propagate, these two holes that are closest to the orifice are the ones that were eliminated. The ones that are out in free space that are not near the orifice are the ones that we left in. Uh, so that should, it, it gives like, I think it's around 400% more material in the area. Okay, did I lose you? Am I still on the call? All right, I don't know if anyone can see me. Huh. An issue in anything except for the machines that are currently out. Um, the, because in one uh, six we'll move to a unified manifold that has a different um, capturing system for the press in orifices. Um, and then these will just complete, continue to support them. Um, with, you know, everything will be supported with the new design. Uh, so that anybody who has a crack, either there's there's three types of cracks. There's a 1-0 crack around the calibrated orifice where there was a spider crack because they were the, the holes were drilled a little too small. That affected a very, very small amount of 1-0 machines. Um, there was the clip rail crack that John was talking about uh, where the, the clip rail was actually machined a little bit. Um, it's very hard to see it, but inside these slots, there's tiny little supports. Uh, and they're they're over machined, and we took away that machining um, because there's no reason to do it really. It's it's just complicates the process and makes them more expensive. Uh, so there's a lot more material there. So that take took away the the clip rail crack, and then in one three when we switched to that stiffer material uh, and a new manufacturer, uh, we ran into that the, the, this strange one uh, that that didn't it seemed to come out of left field. There is a reason for it. Um, we're just not, it may even be a whole constellation, um, but we believe it's fixed now with the, the new design. Charles, Alton's um, well known for cracking, uh, particularly with uh, um, variations in temperature. Um, mm. That's one of the reasons I, um, I take it that you're uh, reinforcing it now with, with the fiber or whatever you're using. But, um, is there any reason you're using Ultimate over Peak? Peak has a twice the temperature tolerance that Ultimate's got, um, and the, very high properties otherwise. Yeah, m most of all Peak uh, being expensive, uh, but it's it you know it's a it's it's kind of half a one, <laughs> half a dozen of one, six of the other. Yeah, I, I appreciate it's a bit more expensive, but. Uh, replacing um, and, and re-engineering that block uh, is expensive. Yeah, as well. that, so got it. that did get expensive. Yeah. <laughs> these parts, these manifolds are among the most expensive parts of the machine. I would say that the, the, um, the brasses, the, those, um, those uh, machine brasses yeah. in the group for the WPI, the inner block and the, the lower brass, the lower shower, those are quite expensive. The manifolds are, are the bulk of the expense of the machine uh, are because of how uh, even just the, the insert that is used in uh, jet engines uh, for fuel delivery and uh, they're insanely <laughs> expensive for what they are. So a, a bulk of the, the cost goes in here and, and to the, the peak would almost double the cost. Um, so we're, we're trying to, I think we should have no issues because we're surrounding the calibrated orifices in 
a sleeve. Um, so there'll be, there'll be a pressed in sleeve in between the ultem uh, and the calibrated orifice, and that should isolate any um, heat cycling or expansive forces. You know, the, the other issue, Damien, is of course, different materials have different coefficients of expansion and contraction. So you put a stainless steel insert inside of a resin chamber, and you know, that in and of itself, that's the reason why other machines suffer uh, failures at weld points because there's, you know, soldering and then the, the, the material and then a brass boiler with a stainless line coming out of it. it it's a nightmare. That's why they, they leave them on all the time and have very strict rules about how they, they cool them down. This is on a, a much smaller scale and, and much less expansion and to worry about, but it is still a concern. So hopefully in, in the all-in-one manifold, it, it's completely settled. And, you know, the good thing is that most of the, the manifolds are out there are solid. Um, we know that we'll have to keep a stock of them, and, you know, in, in order to replace going forward, but we'll just keep supporting it. And luckily it's, it's, they're modular enough that you can just kind of pop them out and pop them back in. Yeah. So the slew of stainless steel that's going into the manifold, is it? Yeah, it's a it's a tiny uh, kind of looks like a top hat, you know. It's, it's and it's absolutely minuscule. We're we're talking about you know like nanometers. It, it's uh, ones, yeah. They're they're super small and and manufactured to super exacting tolerances, and that's the only reason that the system works the way it does. That's where the magic is, kind of. And just getting to your comment about the uh, brass parts, are they going to be uh, manufacturing Ultim in the future? Is that the plan or in the group? Part? Yeah, uh, that's one of the things I'm the most excited about. Um, the the new showers and interblock are uh, a tremendous advantage um, as far as uh, clarity and taste and uh, cleanliness and, and ability to actually adjust temperature because right now we got a big hunk of metal, just like every other machine. We have the ability to adjust temperature. The, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, the, there's often that the discussion pops up about the temperature dip at the beginning of the shot and everybody argues about what it represents. All that is, and it's easy to prove, you can put a, put a um, load of puck into a portafilter, pop it in the freezer, the whole thing, and uh, when, and pull it right out of the freezer after a few hours and brew a shot right away. And you'll see that line will just dive and it will take longer to climb up because you're, you're having, it's showing you the real temperature of the puck. However, it is polluted by uh, the measurement by those, the brass around it. You know, the brass will cool down some because it will, it will leach some of that cold, but uh, the brass has its own thermal mass. The all 10 pieces have almost no reaction at all. And then uh, they're, coupled with a stainless uh, WPI, um, the, the, the part on top that John was showing with the lines and the, the sensors and stuff in it. So the, the WPI stainless, which is, uh, has much less thermal mass than the brass to begin with, and then it is, uh, we've milled, Ben has like gone crazy, m finding every way to mill it out to make it as light as possible. So now you have this nimble little, you know, Porsche that we can kind of take around the corners and really adjust temperature with. Uh, whereas before, the, the measurement is largely polluted by those, those big hunks of brass. So for that reason, it's really exciting because we can temperature profile, we can kind of um, use the, 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 the ability that the machine has, utilize it better now. Um, and then an unexpected benefit but one of the ones that I noticed uh, early on was that they are extraordinarily clean. And the, the best guess I have to venture is that when you put a stainless bolt through two pieces of brass and anchor it in another piece of brass, you're, you're creating a big anode and, and, some, some between the brass leaching and becoming porous and, and the composition changing a bit, coupled with, I think, some kind of attractive forces, the oils and the particles in the coffee really stick to the brass. 
in the Ultem, you can do hundreds of shots. And when you pull them out, there's almost nothing on them. They're, they're just pristine. I mean, there, you're, there is some surface on there, but it's, it's nothing close to the brass. So that was unexpected, but a really happy uh, coincidence. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, we, we, were, we were very excited about that. Yeah, I see that with the brass and space are the two different materials. Like you're saying, it's like the copy acts as a, um, an electrolyte or something to it does. Yeah. Yeah. Or something, there's something going on there. Yeah, you'll see when when uh, when we get the Ultum ones in, uh, it's it's spectacular, and I'm I'm fairly certain it'll take away any kind of con you know concerns about cleaning and back flushing. All you'll have to do is remove the screen once in a while, clean it out. It, they're spectacularly clean, so there's no uh, yeah, there's no <laughs> contamination of flavor. So it's it's a really really good clear cup all the time. The, the clarity is fantastic. So yeah. that's a bonus side effect, but I think the real advantage is in the temperature control, like you're saying. Yeah. You haven't yeah. got a heat thing, but so the next step is to develop a portafiller out of the same material so that <laughs> Yeah. Uh, We've talked about it. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sure you guys have all seen the video where, where somebody did the, the clear porta filters and they all last you know, they they made a bunch of them and they they last about two or three shots before they explode. Yeah. So it would be tough. It would, we'd have to ch totally change the group design. They have to be you know the porta filter would be the size of a Sherman tank, but it could work. Who knows? Interesting. Hey John, quick question that will take just a few seconds to answer. Um, with the catering kit and plumbing kit, there is that level sensor that you mentioned at the beginning of the Zoom call, and when it gets low, it triggers the pumps and fills up the reservoir, and you can adjust what level it happens. People have had issues with air bubbles getting into that measurement area and while it thinks it's low it's full and it overfills the pump um charles has said it's a pretty easy fix and you just lift up that tube but i don't have the machine can you show what he was talking about with uh, adjusting the the intake measurement tube to clear the air bubbles out of it i think there's two things there one is calibrating the water level sensor and the other is air bubbles in the uh, sensor tube. So air bubbles, or it's actually water. It, the column uh, that measures air pressure should be full of air. And if water gets in there, it messes with the water pressure. Okay, system. other so way around, yeah. The, the simplest thing to do is just to lift the, lift the uh, intake tube, pull your tank out, let it down, and then just leave the machine alone for a day or two. Um, and what will happen is now that, there's, now that the tube is in air, that water is just gonna dry. And, uh, and then your, your measurements should be fine. The different issue, which is um, you're using your tablet and you notice there's this much water in the bottom of your tank, but the tablet's telling you there's this much water and you find that annoying. So um, that's uh, an adjustment where, <clears throat> I can show you here with this machine. Essentially, there is a set screw on this body, okay? And you loosen the set screen a set screw, adjust it so that the, uh, the tube goes down all the way, um, almost touching the bottom of the ceramic, and then you get um, a water level management me measure that's a few millimeters more accurate. Uh, but I walked in here, I want to give you guys, and we talked about you know, doom and gloom, um, uh, water leaks and that sort of thing. I want to give you some numbers because we've made 2,000 machines. At this point, we've sent out 25 um, auxiliary manifolds to be replaced. Okay, so 25, uh, and those are almost all exclusively on the 1-3 line. So you're looking at about a 3% failure rate on those. On the 1-0 and 1-1 machines, we're talking about less than 10 machines have had cracks. So um, a total, we're talking about maybe 50 machines out of 2,000 have had a problem um, with this. This uh, the reason I'm in this room, which is why I lost Wi-Fi, is uh, this thing makes a lot of noise, and it's um, 48 manifolds uh, being subjected to constant uh, max pressure, off pressure, and thermal cycling. Let it cool, go up to max temperature. And it's been doing this for about two months. We've done 24,000 cycles on this, and we haven't had a single failure. Okay. So um, that's what we do in order to decide if the design is working, right? Are there any cracks? So 24,000 cycles on, on 48 of them. 
Um, what can I tell you? I, I, I disagree with you, Damien, that um, uh, Ultim is known for cracking and that Peak is the ultimate. Um, we've looked at both the Peak and the Ultim data sheets. They are really similar products. I want to give you a number because uh, I don't think people realize just how expensive this stuff is. That manifold costs us 120 US dollars to make out of Ultim. And that's when we buy 2,000 of them. So peak is typically a multiple of cost on top of the Ultim. Um, and it's not really clear how much benefit. Um, yes, it goes to higher temperatures, but um, I think, what are we, 450 Celsius or something before Ultim starts to melt? It's, it's way beyond um, anything we would do. Um, it does start to soften, what, um, which is why we tend not to put steam through it. Um, or or use it to make a group like Ben did. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in fact, um, Ben has made a steam separator, which is you know, getting 170 Celsius steam out of Ultim, and, and that was fine. So um, going to progressively more esoteric materials isn't always the best idea, especially since people are already upset about the high price of this machine. Um, Ultim is a quite exotic material, especially to be using large quantities of it. Going to peak, you know, I, I just, I, I can't justify using the most expensive materials at every step. I understand, and I think it's important that, to highlight that um, the failure rate is, is very low percentage, and I think, I think that's key. We often um, see things fail, and, and we think uh, it's, uh, it's common particularly when you get two or three people in public saying that um, my manifold leaks, but in reality, um, it's, it's really not failing. It's, um, it's a very small percentage, and um, that percentage is, is quite common in, in any um, appliance. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't um, make the people with the failure any happier about it though. And that's oh. usually my my uh, endeavor is to make sure that the forum, you know, those people are taken care of and um, uh, feel like things are moved along as quickly as possible and, and they get a good solution. And, you know, we stay on coffee talk and insane diatribes about resistance um, and, uh, and all have a really good time doing it. Um, but yeah, it, it, the, the perception can really blow up really fast, especially with um, people who are worried they might have a failure. Um, and all we can do to assuage that is to say, if you do, it'll be, it'll be covered. And it will. Do, do all models have the same manifold? The, the, what is it, the Plus and the Pro? Yes. Um, need to all perform the exact same uh, function. Really, the, the, the biggest difference between the machines is, is slight uh, cosmetic differences uh, in the skinning and stuff like that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, can we just cover the, the, the Corey's question before about the uptake? Um, Corey, if you see here, uh, this is where the the this is, of course, the water uptake. This is the thimble John was talking about before. Um, this angled uh, tube, uh, that's to break surface tension. And that's the air, that's the air column um, that for the air pressure sensor. So at the top of the air column, there's a barb that's a screw-on fitting. And then there's a tiny silicone line that goes to this PCB, which is an air pressure sensor. Uh, there are leak points. Air molecules are small. Um, this barb, where the silicone joins, this barb where the silicone is, and also the threading where this fitting fits on, they all leak air. So if you just leave this in uh, for three weeks and you, you don't uh, lift it at all and clear all the air pressure out and then dip it back in and reset the air pressure, eventually the air molecules will leak out and it will just stabilize with atmospheric pressure. And the machine will perceive that as an empty tank. Uh, so that's why we say every once in a while, we, the assumption was when we built the machine, again, this is the, the kind of the staying ahead of the development of the machine is tough. It's like when we built in water heating and it, it, it um, complicated this air pressure sensor, 
Um, we, when that got built in, we were trying to offer a feature and we made the, the fill thing uh, and, and the, the water level measurement a little unstable, but we felt it was more important to offer the feature uh, than it was to, to worry about that. And then tried to develop a better uh, tank level sensor, which uh, we're moving along on, uh, but it's, it's, uh, we want to get it right so we don't have to do it again. Um, so there is a possibility to seal this fitting with some silicone tape and, and you can seal these with lines. But if you don't have a refill kit, you have to lift this out to refill your tank and that resets it anyhow. The one caveat is this, if you use uh, the tank heater, um, when the water gets hot, so does this. Uh, so the, the uh, tube, the air pressure column, gets hot, the air inside it gets hot, and it expands, and it bubbles out the bottom of the tube. Now, when the water cools, this is submerged in water, so it can't suck more air in again, and now it creates a vacuum, or at least it creates lower pressure than it should have, uh, because that hot air bubbled out, and when it cools down, now there's a bit of a vacuum, and again, the machine perceives it either as empty or as a lower uh, level than it than it actually is, and those are the, the reasons why that happens. And all you have to do is to simply just lift it out, um, leave it there for five ten seconds, make sure any waters come out, and then and dip it back in, and and that should take care of it. Charles, is that the thing that gets picked up from the lever in the back of the machine? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I want to show you the old versus new. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's exciting. So here's what Charles is holding. And so it's a tube, and then there's a cap on it here. Um, all the 1-4 machines don't do that anymore. We have improved the design. It's a bit fancier. But the cap is now fully made at the same time. So there's no more cap. So the, this was a little bit tricky to air seal, to get that perfectly sealed. So now the entire piece of metal goes directly into that fitting or this fitting, and there's no possibility of air getting in there. So we think that um, that change as of 1.4 will likely um, reduce the air going into the sensor. Um, I don't actually ever lift, I, I, all our machines here are plumbed and I don't ever lift the water level sensor. So um, I, Charles talks okay, about the clients than I do, but um, I, I've never found that to be a need. Yeah. Yeah, it seems some of the machines are leak a little bit, leach air a little more than others. And it makes sense because some of the barbs will be a little different. Maybe the inside of the silicone tube is a little inconsistent, let the air out quicker. It's, it's hard to say why exactly, but. So let's go back um, inside again, since we're inside the D1. So uh, this right here is what's called an overpressure valve. Okay. And that's a, a safety and See if you can see it, but you can see it from the side. Basically what happens is this is during espresso. Um, this here is a valve that if it goes over a certain pressure, the water comes out and it goes right out back into the water tank. So that's not something that normally would happen, but that's a safety for anything going over pressure. And then here you can see this tube to this, okay? This is the return. So when you first hit start on your espresso, you hear it go chugga, 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 and then click. Before the click, what's happening is water is going all the way into here and being measured to see if the temperature is accurate. Because when we measure the water, we mix the water going here, we might aim for a certain temperature, but by the time it hits the Elton and valves and such, those things are not hot. And so it cools it slightly. So when you hit start, the water is being mixed to hit the target temperature, but if it doesn't hit it, it gets returned back in the water tank. And some of you have commented that you hear a splashing sound. Um, that's what's going on, is water is not being wasted, it's not being discarded, it's being sent back to the water tank until you hear a click, and then water then is going into the group head um, and, and starting there. And one of the changes we made recently that was the cafe versus home mode settings is that the flow rate of water being sent back to the water tank can be set to match 
the flow rate that's going into the group. So that way, before we were two mils per second, um, and what would happen is the water needs to quickly accelerate. Uh, now it just flips. Uh, and the other thing we do is that we have a two-stage heating test. So the first stage is <clears throat> um, getting these tanks, so these heaters. These heaters here, there's a steam heater and a hot water heater. So when you hit start, you have a few seconds sometimes where this heater needs to come up to um, about 110 Celsius. If you're in cafe mode, that's real fast. And if you just did a shot, it might be instant. Um, if you're in home mode, that can be as long as 20 seconds because these things are being kept at a much lower ambient temperature to save um, electricity. So that's what happens when you hit start is these two things get cranked up from less than what we need to the temperature we need. Then the water mixing happens. It gets tested here, flushed here, and then goes to the espresso. Um, here on this circuit board here, these are all these little white things. This is where all the temperature sensors unite. So to make it kind of simpler to do repairs, all those have little labels and every temperature sensor you can see has a color. Uh, one thing that's changing in 142 is we found a, um, a temperature sensor manufacturer that will make us colored wires. So we don't have to add the colored sleeves anymore. That'll just make it a little bit more tidy. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, there's one more thing I want to show you, which is this right here. This is the flush valve. Okay, when you're making espresso, this is also on the circuit and this is closed. See how this is a black tube? The reason that's black is that marries to the black tube in the group head. So when you're making espresso, this is closed, okay, and thus creating pressure. And when you end your espresso, this opens and we keep the brown tube, which is here, with water pushed into the group. That valve opens so that water comes out the black tube, comes out the flush. And then finally, there's a little black box there that's essentially a little maze because when that water leaves the group head, it's at nine bar. And if you've used any traditional machines, they'll often have a valve pointing down towards the drip tray and it goes and it can spray you. Right. So what we do is, I can show you that. See that right here? That is where the flush valve uh, empties into. And there's a box. So the flush valve lets nine bar water go into that. And then there's a maze that slows the velocity down and also cools it because if it's steam, it needs to be converted to water. <clears throat> and then it drips out here. Now, this is the latest model, and it doesn't have the little plastic extension. We had to spend, well, essentially four years to make this thing not drip. So that's just a thing like this. And what we found is all of you who have 101113 machines, you have a little clear plastic sleeve on top of that. And even though the, the thing is angled down, what would happen is it would be a little drip of water, and through capillary action, that thing would crawl back up and then drip behind the drip tray. So to work around that, we put a little plastic sleeve on that because um, the water droplet wouldn't crawl up a silicon sleeve. It will crawl up the metal. So if you're wondering why that little sleeve is on your uh, tube, that's the reason. It's to prevent the dripping from going back up. Um, we finally, every year, we, we tweak this shape to try and prevent the dripping. And uh, I think as of uh, one four. I don't know, Charles. Do we have it? Do we have these on one three? The little plastic sleeve. Uh, yeah, yeah. They're they're available for for each each version, and then one four, the bigger hole. Uh, it seems like it. They they're not necessary, and they yeah, it's yeah. raised a little bit so it doesn't interfere with the drip tray. So from the bottom here, we can see a couple things. Okay. So got uh, this is return and flush. Okay, so water. As I said, returning before the espresso, and this is the overpressure. Uh, sorry, not flush, overpressure and return. Okay. Um, and then this thing here is how the refill kit works. So the refill kit plugs water in here, and then there's a tube that then drops it into the water tank. Okay. And we have a little air gap that's needed for uh, EU regulations so that water can never go back into the house system. And then here's our tube. And what I want to show you is 
that is the filter. Now, those of you who don't have much algae or uh, uh, just really nice water with not much uh, calcium, this thing doesn't need to be cleaned very often, but, uh, but it does need to get cleaned every once in a while. So you just pull it out, give it a rinse. If you own a water pick, that works really well. Uh, and then it goes there and you just push it back in. Um, and what's the trigger for the safety valve? Um, is it 11? Uh, no, 13 bar. Is that right? The safety valve is, is purchased and is, I'm not sure if it's 13 or 15 bar. I think it's 18, John. We, the, the initial high pressure on the machine, we were able to do a 15 bar on the first firmware. Okay. So I think it's, it's higher than that. Okay. Um, on the back here, let me explain a little bit what we're looking at. So here, where it says decent, this gets covered with a piece of plastic but that you can remove. This is where the Bluetooth module goes. And the reason we put it on a plug is because my experience with uh, other smart devices is that communications are the thing that goes obsolete. So I had a smart treadmill with an RS-232, and uh, those are kind of hard to find now, those big DB9 thing and there's no way to change it. So um, what we wanted is to make this thing, which is the Arduino standard, um, something that, first of all, there's a bunch of R&D on, so we're not the only ones making it, uh, and the communications can be upgraded. So that is currently Bluetooth uh, 4. I think actually this ones are 4.1, but we've also tried ones where there's a Bluetooth chip and a Wi-Fi chip on it. Um, the thing that Reed Taylor did, plugged into this and gave us a uh, USB on it. For safety reasons and also for hackability, in other words, for extensibility, this is a separate computer. So what this is actually is a serial port. It's a high-speed serial port. And for Bluetooth, there's a computer that plugs in that does Bluetooth. So that way, if the Bluetooth, for example, got hacked or uh, just went insane, it crashed, it can't actually affect the safeties in the machine. The safety, all it can do is send requests over this serial port for the machine to do things, and the machine has its own operating system and decides if it wants to follow them or not. Um, so um, that was our goal, was anything that communicated with the outside world would essentially have this firewall that you can't get into it. it what's also cool about this little chip here is it is Arduino uh, targetable, so if you're a programmer, you can write a little program, burn it into those little chips and put it in here um, and have it run a software program that then has a high speed connection to the espresso machine. Um, the thing we're looking at is adding a USB port. We're either gonna add it here or here. Now here, this is just essentially our expansion port. Currently this is used for refill. It looks like a ethernet port, but it's not. We use Ethernet because it's quite reliable. It's inexpensive. Um, it currently supplies voltage on the line when we want to add water to the machine. However, only half the pins are used. The other half um, are available and go right to the CPU. So our plan is for this thing to be, for one, a breakout box. So you could plug in external like foot pedals, for example, to it. The other thing we want to do with it is um, we've got an experimental board that gives us two USB ports. One to the debug, the repairman's port, which is that right there. And the other is to the machine itself. Uh, the nice thing about that is that everyone from 1.0 on could then add a USB port by just going click here and you don't have to open the machine up. Uh, but we're still trying to figure mm -hmm. out yeah. if we want to do that. Hi, John. This is me, Majid. Any idea about add, any idea about adding USB C Type C? Uh, so USB C is just for me a terrible idea. Um, it's you, you can read about it. There's just huge compatibility issues. Um, it's expensive. The automatic um, charge power negotiation stuff is really complicated. So we are really committed to USB A, um, and I don't see any advantage for us to move to C. Um, USB-A will give us tons of throughput uh, in terms of bandwidth between the espresso machine and this. Um, the reason that we're looking at this plug here um, is it is 10 megabit capable. Um, so it might also become an ethernet plug. I don't know. 
but like, obviously at some point there'll be more advanced USB, but I feel like if we do A, that's already quite good. Um, I will, since we're talking about hardware, um, I am preparing a blog post on this. So our normal tablet manufacturer had basically trouble getting good screens and has taken five months to ship, well, <laughs> claims they'll take five months. Uh, I still don't have the tablets. So we ran out of tablets, which is really annoying. And we ended up having to evaluate a whole bunch. Um, so that's not one of them. Let's see if I have one, here we are. So we have bought retail uh, 200 of these tablets. Um, and uh, these are running Android 9. So the next 200 people to receive an espresso machine from us are getting a significantly nicer, more expensive tablet from us. Not only the Android 9, the Specint, uh, which is the, the sorry, the, um, it's the Android benchmark, Geekbench. Geekbench is about, um, I think about 80% faster on these tablets. And there are also, and I'm blanking now on the display technology, uh, but instead of LCD, it is I something. Someone's going to tell me what it is. Um, but the displays are even crisper. So, IPS. Uh, yeah, there you go. IPS. It's an IPS screen. Um, Android 9. Um, <clears throat> so that's uh, 200 of those are going out. And I've been working on the Android 9 compatibility. It's, it's really solid and quite nice. Um, so that's, that's what we've got there. Um, and then I think next month we'll go back to our normal tablets that are bespoke for us. So those are retail tablets, um, which we basically bought retail like you would. So, uh, but you got to do what you got to do. You got a question in the chat. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, let's see. James Patton, who, who asked the question? That's the one I saw. Yeah. All yeah, right. That's me. No, we're never going to do a dual boiler, um, and we're never going to do steam. So the, the thing, of, I, I don't know if I actually want to cover this because I, I've written extensively on it. So I'll just say very, very quickly that steam on boilers is actually not great. Um, it's got a lot of problems. It's actually quite wet. Uh, it peters out. Um, and so uh, the steam that we're able to do on the machine over here, let's see if it's powered up. I mean, it just, it's just much better than you will ever get a boiler. It's 170 Celsius at five bar. Uh, the maximum a boiler is allowed to do is 2.8 bar of pressure. So by having open to atmosphere steam. Um, okay. But like a dual bar, I guess just the ability to, to do both, but not the actual because the power. So this machine oh, okay. here, uh, this is running 10 amp steam. Okay, so okay. 10 amp on a 230 line, and it's awesome. So I'm 21 seconds to heat 200 mils of milk, which is like a commercial machine. It's, it's that's quite good. The 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 microfoam is really good because it's super dry. Um, so in order for you to make espresso and make steam, I would need to give you a 10 amp plug and then another plug to do espresso which is oh. not allowed, right? The alternative would be for me to give you weak steam while you made espresso, and then for the steam power to increase when your espresso ended, which would be a bad experience. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, no, we're not gonna do steam during brew. We are making, as far as I'm concerned, the best steam in the world by going to super high temperatures, super high pressures, um, calibrated steam one tips. Um, so this is Zhu Bing's latest Steam one tip, it needs cleaning. Um, I've talked to my staff about that. Um, but if you want steam while brew, um, get two machines. Um, UL will not allow us to put two plugs. And my main goal is saving baristas time in cafes. And to do that, it's to give them more power. So that's an experimental 10 app machine that is, um, uh, we just ordered more heaters, 10 amps is the maximum we can do on a 230 line in a home. Mm -hmm. In order to go to 13, 15 amps, uh, maybe even 20, uh, we need to change the plug and the certification is different. And um, that's an R&D and that might happen. But I also, I don't, uh, I mean, I've used machines that heat 200 mils in six seconds and it just makes terrible foam. So if we're really fast, but the drink quality is poor, I don't think that's a game. Does like does like the shot when it 
when you're when you're steaming milk does the shot like die or lose i don't know quality because it's just sitting for a few like 30 seconds or no uh, if i the the there is an argument that yeah. espresso gets bitter as soon as it cools and yeah. it's been well established that that's um bullshit um the the, the espresso is bitter what is changing is your ability to taste it. And, oh. <clears throat> and that the hotter something is, the less you can taste. Uh, you can in, there's an increase in the ability to taste um, a liquid that increases until 30 Celsius. At 30 Celsius, you can now taste everything. Um, when an espresso comes out and it's around 60 Celsius, you, you can't taste much. Um, so when an espresso is going bitter, as it cools, it's because it is bitter. Uh, and your ability to, to taste it is increasing as it cools. Uh, there, uh, the World Barista Champion, Willem Davies, started a trend and then tried to convince the other people that uh, he drinks his espressos cool. He lets them sit for several minutes. And he managed to convince most of the other uh, World Barista Champions that he was absolutely bang on right. Uh, in fact, if you want to drink an espresso and really taste it, you should A, let it cool, B, dilute it. Yeah, I, know, I actually, um, I have like an RO system and it makes, you know, like little perfect ice uh, cube things. Yeah. And I just put one of those in there and people, I mean, everyone thinks it's weird, but I th I like it, so. Yeah, and it tastes better. Uh, yeah. Especially if you're doing light roast that's very uh, floral or fruity. Um, when that thing's really hot, you're just going to taste strong and, and mm. So sorry if I react negatively, but no, uh, I mean, I, I feel like we are, we are because we've made very different decisions um, mm -hmm. to go high tech, to go sensor based and to just be uncompromising that quality is the most important thing. Um, I remember years ago, <clears throat> the, one of the top two biggest espresso machine companies said, come visit us. So you do. Um, and, and at one point in the meeting, they said our priorities for the company are number one speed this is of the machine speed reliability and third is drink quality of the three priorities drink quality is last and i said right. that's funny because i'm exactly the opposite i'm drink quality number one reliability number two speed dead last mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and they kind of yeah, like, i guess if you're in the home it doesn't matter about speed if it takes you an extra minute i don't know i think a cafe is good you know i think 80 percent of cafes make bad coffee so uh, I think there's a real opportunity for cafes to start making things their customers enjoy more. If they have to and, wait 10 seconds more. Well, and the, and the problem is easily solved by a second group in a cafe. Um, you know, cafes are usually used to using two and three machines. Um, part of that is that uh, they need the groups because they're all hands-on with the DE. A lot of what they need to be doing, their hands are freed up because most of the processes are automated. Um, and so to, to put an extra group on to steam isn't, uh, number one, it's super cost competitive on our end and, uh, and the steam is really good. So, you know, the other thing that when John said uncompromising and boo, be who decent espresso is, uh, it's also about the small footprint. And you stuff a boy, even if you put in an old school two ounce boiler and, and we do some magic to make that work better, it still makes the machine bigger. And, and the machine doesn't need to be big. It's already making the best espresso that you can make uh, mm -hmm. currently on any machine. And so it, it, you don't need a behemoth uh, machine to, to do that. And yeah, you do yeah. give up the steam and brew, but a second head takes care of that. Yeah, I was trying to explain that to uh, my brother-in-law because he saw the machine and he's, you know, he's expecting this traditional E61 group head, all this chrome. He was expecting chrome everything. And I was like, no, this is like the Tesla of espresso. Like this has all kinds of features that we don't even know how to properly probably use yet. But um, that's, uh, that's how I was trying to describe it, even though I don't have it. Actually, I just got 1736. I guess that's my, my machine. Woo. <laughs> I just got one. Um, I think I've covered the machine pretty well, but I'm happy to answer any questions uh, and go back to it. Hi, John. Um, this is David here. Um, since you guys have a like, pretty good hang on the, um, the steam quality, 
do you have any plans to build um, a dedicated steam machine? Um, I don't think we're going to do a dedicated steam machine. Um, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is in order to do the really good steaming, you need most of what the D1 is, right? You need the AC, the DC board, you need the steam heater, you need the intake, you need uh, a pump. Um, so it would cost two thirds of what a D1 would cost. Um, and um, uh, would it have a tablet or not? If it doesn't have a tablet, is it just a button control? Does it then talk to the main machine or not? Um, I mean, um, Damien's skin has this cool thing where you weigh the milk and then the steam stops at the right point. Would you lose that feature? Um, <clears throat> Would, I mean, the interface is nice, being able to control steam flow, steam temperature. So a tablet's kind of useful. Um, so I'm going on, I've been going on a rant, but the answer is no. Um, there are a few other companies that have made dedicated steam heaters, and they've failed in the marketplace. And if we had to sell you a steamer at $2,000 instead of three, would you buy it? I don't think so. Um, it took maybe half the footprint. The D1's already so small. Um, I mean, I feel like um, Mavum and Modbar do that. Uh, they do that nicely. We could copy that, but I think that more likely, instead of having dedicated task objects, right, hot water, steam, espresso, like Modbar has, we've got an all-in-one single machine that does everything, it does those three. It's quite small and you just have multiples of them. Uh, this is a 10 amp steam. Uh, and mm -hmm. so I don't know if you can see, but you know you can't see. In fact, that's kind of the point, right? There, this is 10 amp steam. It's about 40% more powerful than the current one. And it's still really dry. So we're in Hong Kong, which is humid, humid air. And um, I'm not getting any water in my hands, even though the, the pressure we're at, this is a four bar right now. Um, and I feel like that's where we should go. Uh, we should push the limits of smart control over what espresso machines do, over steam and hot water, pour overs. Um, <clears throat> And I, so I don't see us separating the machine out into just a steam heater. Um, we are starting to sell quite a bit now to cafes. Um, I've got someone who's negotiating for 15 machines right now and deploying it all around. Um, <clears throat> that's one, another one in Thailand, it's like a dozen machines. So um, I don't see cafe chains having a problem with buying a whole bunch of our machines. The footprint's small, they can, they can figure out their uh, workflow. And have space on hand. A company too, uh, we gotta focus. I think it's actually a better idea. If you consider a commercial machine and the footprint of this machine, um, so you'd fit three of these in the same space, you fit um, a traditional three group machine. And what you're getting here is um, three, three steam functions, um, whereas a traditional machine, you'd only have one steam one. Um, so in the same sense, you can still make coffee and steam at the same time uh, for the same space you would take up for the, the other machine, but you, you've also got the option to steam on um, on other ones if, if um, need be. So I think it's a much better design. I think people just um, are, are used to seeing the traditional type machine and, um, and, and, and don't appreciate the change so much. They get, they, they want to um, see things that they're familiar with. And I think that's where it's getting, that's what um, draws people to that type of design. But um, I think this is a much better design. You can expand at will. Um, if you get a breakdown, you don't take out the whole machine. You, you take out one module if, you, if you're a cafe set up. So you know, I think it's really positive. Um, there are a few things in the chat that I didn't answer. Um, one question was, is there any reason to heat the machine up or is five minutes um, um, enough? I think most people who have a coffee every morning should set the timer to heat the machine up. So if they stumble out of bed, the machine's ready to go. 
the tablet app lets you do that. Um, so let's see. Um, there was uh, in the queue, what exactly is the V1 Cafe? The V1 Cafe, we made 10 of them. Those are the 10 amp machines I just showed you. So they're V1 XLs, but with a 10 amp instead of a 7 amp heater in them. And so they heat up a little bit faster and uh, they make more powerful steam. Um, the word ASSY in the queue, that uh, is just the word assembly. And, <clears throat> and Whenever I see the word SSY on a description out there, the people I remove it. So D1 Cafe SSY doesn't mean anything. It just means assembly. But uh, last night I changed it to D1. Um, so um, is there a, a possibility for a prototype paddle? Um, yeah. Uh, in fact, one of the things we're going to do in the future is more fully document the, <clears throat> uh, the communication between the group head controller, the group head controller, and the machine. So that the group head controller is running its own CPU. And these rainbow colored cables, there's two of them, um, are what go to the group head controller, which has its own board, which has its own chip, and then you can unplug it. So um, we at one point worked with someone else who wanted to do a steampunk kind of crazy thing here. And um, so we started to document what the protocol was back and forth and we will fully document that at some point there shouldn't be any safety issues because this thing like the stroke port is a request to the machine to do uh to do things and um, the nice thing about these cables this is again a high speed connection so that's why moving this has real-time control over flow and pressure um, so and in fact i think we thought that if someone were going to do robotics um they might want to use this thing, because then you have really high speed access to um, everything. So yeah, paddle. Uh, any testing on Weber's steam dial spring clean? Uh, not yet. They should both be coming shortly. So I don't know. <clears throat> any other questions? One new message, USB. Uh, we're working on adding USB as a dongle out the back. Is there an auto reminder to clean the machine? So cleaning, cleaning is a topic that comes up often. And um, I guess I want to explain why we don't have really good cleaning instructions, which is, uh, I'm going to turn it around into a hypothetical, which is, why do you think I would know anything about cleaning? Um, I, I'm a programmer. We have engineers who know how to build things, but why would we know anything about cleaning? Why? It seems to me that the world experts on cleaning would be baristas at cafes. Um, they're the ones who would know how to take things apart. They make things dirty at a level that we don't. You know, we make 100 coffees a day here. Um, and uh, we clean it once a week. Um, but I can't say we do an awesome job, but I, I don't personally have any problems. Um, and then the other is um, about cleaning is I don't know what your level of cleanliness is. Uh, I'm a lazy guy, and my idea of cleaning is to take things apart and throw them in a dishwasher. Uh, and if I can't put it in a dishwasher, I, I generally don't clean them. So um, that's not, I would say, a worldwide appreciated level of cleanliness. Um, so my preference for the cleaning guidelines, uh, we've used materials that are in other machines. Lots of other machines have PPFE tubes, have brass, uh, the same pumps and valves. And so uh, my hope is that um, we'll have guidelines that the community creates based on the experience of professionals for what the right way is to clean this. We do know that certain chemicals are a bad idea. That's why we recommend, for example, citric acid to clean it. Um, there have been some cases where the machines have been ultra clogged and we've used some higher concentration of some other chemicals, but you've got to be really good about it because it's etching into the materials. So it, it'll clean the clog, but it'll also etch through other things. Um, so citric acid, to my knowledge, does not ever damage anything. And um, we have a pretty cool community. Uh, what we need to discover is the acid and base cleaning equivalent of citric acid. 
right? So generally, um, the way you clean an espresso machine is you alternate between acids and bases to clean out different things. Um, the acid citric acid is great. Um, what I don't think we have done is a guideline of um, base. So um, anyway, we'll get there. Uh, we'll get there, but the, the goal is the cleaning guidelines will not be a top-down thing from us. Um, we have the, you know, if you ask the Ultim manufacturer what you can clean it with, what chemicals you can clean it with, they just don't want to tell you. There's no one who wants to take responsibility for cleaning products. Uh, yes, Descal is okay. Descal is okay for the tank and uh, Kafiza is okay for the group, but do not use Kafiza in the tank. And also, as far as bases, I can unequivocally say, do not ever use potassium hydrochloride in the machine, uh, which is also known as mentioning. That's the one I wasn't mentioning, which will clean out anything in your tank, um, as well as, uh, unless you're very good at it, eat out bits of your machine as well. Yeah. And it will also explode the <laughs> Don't use what? Yeah. Uh, uh, don't put drip coffee in your water tank to get extra strong espresso. Correct. <laughs> Please. It takes a long time to clean it. Uh, Just a food for thought. I, um, I'm a believer in prevention rather than cure. So there's a lot of things we can uh, practice that uh, prevent the need to clean or the frequency of the need to clean. And, and one of them is, well, the biggest one is avoiding calcium to start with. And it's quite easy to do is um, use a water source with no calcium um, ions in it, and then you won't get scale buildup. Um, the magnesium will build some scale, but it's uh, quite a bit softer and will dissolve with, uh, with low acidity a lot easier. So it shouldn't be a problem. But um, if, you, if you want to go further, you can avoid uh, magnesium ions as well. Um, so that, that takes care of the descaling. And, and in my case, I just don't descale because I use RO water with a TDS of around 12 parts per million, but there's no calcium ions. So I don't get scale buildup. It's, it's so simple. Um, similar with the steam one, that's another area you've got to clean. Now, um, I've just developed a practice where I remove my junk before um, or remove my steam one from the milk um, right at the end when the steam is still coming out. So there's no chance of any milk sucking back up into the wand. Um, and that way I never have to clean it because I never get milk up into inside the wand. Um, so that's just developing practices that uh, avoid the need for cleaning. Um, the other parts that get dirty is the group. Um, so the brass parts get dirty. Um, you can take them out. They're quite easy to take out. It's quite easy to take the uh, gasket out and you can physically check if they're, they're cleaning and, and you can determine quite quickly uh, how frequently you need to clean for your usage and for your situation. Some people use um, filter paper on top of their puck. Um, that might mean that they need to clean less frequent. Um, some people like myself might make one coffee a day. Um, so cleaning once a week, once a fortnight is, is, is plenty. Um, somebody that's using a, a cafe might need to clean daily after the close of each shift. Um, so in those situations, it's very hard to put a manual together and say, okay, this is what you should do. Um, what I think is more important is to get a, to understand your machine, um, understand how to pull the group out, how to look for things that are dirty, um, look, understand what's causing it to be dirty and, and, and what to do if it needs cleaning. I think that's the, uh, the, the educational type of approach we need to take more so than just writing a book on, um, on best practice sort of thing. Um, so there's a question here of using zero TDS water, which is referring to, I think, distilled water that's not recommended, um, that um, having some minerals will, that water, uh, distilled water loves to grab stuff. And if you use purely distilled water, it's not going to be great. It's going to take essentially stuff out of the metal um, in order to have, have something. Um, so no, don't. It also doesn't taste great. Uh, I'm going to reduce cleaning down to just three things that I think are the main issues. Just before you go, just before you go into there, I just want to um, touch on that zero TDS. There's a lot of confusion there with um, reverse osmosis. Um, it doesn't reduce the, the the water down to zero TDS. To get to zero TDS, you need to use a deionized resin, uh, filter through a deionizing resin. 
And that's where you, water becomes then very attractive to metals and can etch metals and stuff. But if you're using an RO filter, you might get down to eight uh, parts per million, uh, to the S of eight parts per million, and that's quite safe to drink. Um, my filter here, um, I, I use both. I use um, um, deionized water for, for when I mix chemicals, for reagents and from, for other things. But um, prior to that deionizing stage, the water's quite safe. Um, and if you want to put some minerals back in, you can do that. And you can put the minerals back in um, without putting CA back into it. And that's the problem. The CA iron is where the problem is. Yeah. I'm, what I was going to say was uh, pretty much what Damien just said. So three things. The number one thing you can do to prevent machine problems is to use water that isn't going to have calcium buildup. That's just the number one, number one, number one thing. So the easiest way to do that is just to, uh, if you don't have special equipment, is to buy um, water, usually, um, uh, so something like Volvique and there's some others, Crystal Geyser, that are low calcium. You can read on the label, they either low or no calcium. If you do that, first of all, your espresso will taste better. Secondly, the, the whole, you don't have anything to clean out. So you might have magnesium that deposits, but it comes right out as part of normal use. So that's the number one thing you can do is use good water. Um, so number two is um, clean your steam wand tip. So now we're moving from water to milk. So just each time you make steam, you know, clean it off. Um, and also uh, make sure that you never have the uh, milk jug full of milk and the steam wand in it because that will suck milk back in the tube, blah, 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 okay? And then the third uh, most important thing is um, clean, keeping the group clean. So a couple things. One is when you flush, then take a rag and then just wipe here on the screen. You should be doing that pretty much every espresso anyway. So you make an espresso, you flush, you give it a, just a quick wipe. And then if you think your espresso is starting to taste not great, um, then put this around here uh, to take the group head parts out. You just unscrew that, and everything comes right out. Um, and then you can clean it with soap and water, and then you just reassemble it. The only thing to pay attention to is there's a few parts that have rotation locks on them. So when it's done, it should all sit flush like this. If it doesn't sit flush, then you need to rotate the parts so they click. Um, for me, those are the three things that you need to keep clean in the machine. Um, if you do, I don't generally have other problems. Uh, Just a, be specialized. Go ahead. Quick note on the steam wand. Uh, both Ben and I have done, uh, I did 90 days of zero cleaning of the steam wand. None. No, I didn't even wipe it. Just put it out of the milk jar. Let the auto purge do its thing and then use it that way for 90 days. At the end of the 90 days, there was uh, three millimeters thick of milk solids on, but they were just burned, baked every day, so they didn't smell. It was a little, uh, almost looked like a, yeah, like a cow crust was on there and picked it off at the end and it was fine. And, and during that entire time, I never uh, experienced, there was no reduction in steam quality. There was no uh, clogging. There was no anything because the auto purge was enough to take care of that. The biggest problem is <clears throat> leaving the pitcher until after the auto purge is finished. Some people don't want to remove the pitcher because they're afraid the auto purge will blow milk. But if you pull it, at the end of the, uh, right before the auto purge, and it's about a two to three second gap, which is a considerable amount of time, um, <clears throat> you'll never ever have to worry about the steam wand tip clogging. It's only if you let it auto purge, then pull the wand, because even if uh, just a moment is all it takes for the, the steam heater to cool, where it creates a vacuum and starts to suck milk into the tip. It might not get to the heater, but it will get inside the tip and then you'll have some adhesion and some burning and, and clogging issues. So if you just pull this pitcher um, before, and, and like I said, both Ben and I did this for way longer than I, I recommend anybody do it because it's super gross, but just to, just to prove the point to ourselves that the system that we had worked uh, because we were getting a lot of uh, mixed reports and, and we were able to uh, dispel that.
just on that, Charles, I did an experiment myself where, because um, I use timer for milk. Um, right. So you get those little pulses at the end of the timer right. until uh, you press stop and activate the, the surge. Um, if I leave my wand in, submersed in the milk um, after it times out, those yeah. pulses aren't keeping the milk out. The milk is sucking up as it cools down. Yeah, and I, I think agree. That's, that's important. Yeah, I think yeah. that uh, people need to be careful there not to put the timer on, walk away, and, and ghost steam, I think was a term that was used at one yeah. stage for that. Um, to, to so get those, that on those pulses are simply... Uh, the the milk will get into the end of the tip on those. Uh, what it, I should have been more specific. I was referring to uh, manually stopping it and pulling pulling before the auto purge. Um, but yes, if it times out and you have those little uh, auto puffs, the auto puffs are simply meant to keep the line to the heater. Uh, John was talking about the 1.2 millimeter inner diameter of the line. The auto puffs are simply meant to keep that line at positive pressure so that the, the, the milk doesn't make it all the way back to the heater. Because when it makes it there, then it's a, a bigger problem than in the tip. The tip sucks because you have to you know, pull it out and clean it out. But, but when it gets to the heater, uh, it's a lot harder to pull the, clean, the heater out and, and clean it out. I know because I've been there. But the, um, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. It does, it does get into the tip, though. And then you, you do have to pull it and clean it. Um, the, the trouble is, is that we made uh, Ray made them stronger, uh, the auto puffs, and then the complaint was that the auto puffs were ruining the texture of the milk, and then you make them too weak and too much milk is getting in the wand. So it's the, it's that fine finagling of you know the subjective needs of uh, a pretty big user base, but trying to make it as objective as possible for the. The, the physical needs in the machine, but that does allow a little bit in the tip. So you, you do need to clean it every so often. And I, I think if you time it, I mean, I know once you pull it and you stop it with the auto puffs, there is an auto purge, but it's probably worth uh, doing a little longer purge yourself. Although if milk is in the tip, that hot steam is just going to cook the milk inside of it anyway, and you're still going to need to clean it. I, I never let it submerge. So as the timer gets to zero seconds, I'm removing the jug. I, I yeah. still hold the jug. I don't, I don't uh, go steam as such. But on that subject about the uh, steam, um, the foaming quality change, um, we, we were discussing uh, in one post that the latest firmware seems to be a backward step in the steam. Now, I'm not sure... Um, there was a change, I think, with preheating, using uh, the heater to preheat um, before the steam heater. Um, I'm not sure if that's related, but with, with the firmware that introduced that, um, several of us noticed that uh, our steam becomes more um, aerated, I think. It, not so much aerated, but the, bu the bubbles are fine. Uh, there's larger bubbles in the milk. Um, One thing I will say in that regard is that the, the newest steam profiles require a little bit different steaming technique. You should start by immediately plunging the steam wand and then bringing it slowly from submerged to the surface. Uh, the reason for this is Ray uh, programmed in a, a four mil per second for a very short time, but a four mil burst that at the beginning. Um, and that's to give a little bit of momentum to get the whirlpool started um, because some, it was difficult at times to get the, the milk swirling. You could start incorporating air, but really have a tough time getting the vortex going. And, and so you can really get a good venturi from the tip um, and add air the way that you really want to add air. But the, the result of that is that if you have it close to the surface, the way that you would steam traditionally, uh, with the DE1 before, it can blow a bunch of big air bubbles. And as soon as that happens, it's very hard. You have to spend the rest of the time furiously whirling the milk, trying to incorporate those and using the jet to break up all the bubbles. And it doesn't work as well as, as just starting it right. You know, on a regular kind of commercial machine, uh, the art 
is the steam valve, you know, knowing how just how to open it up. So you start the whirlpool and you start the air incorporation, but you don't get that big burst that, that creates those bubbles. And this is a bit like that, but just start with it. Uh, try it for, you know, a couple of times, see if you can uh, change the technique a bit. Start with a tip submerged, maybe, uh, you know, three centimeters or something, and then uh, slowly lower the jug until you get near the air and start incorporating air. And I think that will fix the texture problem. If not, it might be related to your, uh, your particular flow issues, but I have more ideas about that. I'll, I'll talk to you on Diaspora about that. No worries, makes sense. I think uh, I'll jump in for, oh, sorry, I was going to jump in more about the, the steam, Damon. Um, I do think you, you seem to be having an issue in your machine with the steam control flow not being correct, and I'm not quite sure what the deal is there. We'll have to look into that. Um, but as far as the, uh, the preheating is concerned, it actually shouldn't make much difference. Because um, it was preheated before. It's, what it's doing now is it's controlling the, the, the input temperature, whereas before it was somewhat variable. And so we're, we're, we're using the preheat to guarantee that the input temperature is at a certain point. And um, in theory, it should be making things more robust um, and, <coughs> and more predictable. And, uh, you know, it, when it provides extra heat to the system, it tends to only provide it actually further into the, into the steam shaft. So at the beginning of the shot, you're usually getting the leftover heat um, from your water heater plus the steam heater, and then the steam heater is going to full power. And then as the steam heater starts backing off a little bit in order to control the pressure and the flow, um, the uh, main water heater then gets a chance to add its own heat, and it starts helping out later on in the shot. So for the first 10 seconds, 15 seconds, I don't know, maybe 25 seconds of the shot, I don't actually expect the preheating to be making that much difference. Um, so anyway, uh, that's that's all I needed to say. I understand that, and I can't. Uh, it doesn't seem logical, but in practice, what's happening is um, I'm getting a lot more bubbles in my milk, um, and even when if I let the jug sit after I steam for a short time, um, I, it's layering out. So it's like uh, making a cappuccino type. Um, foam where you're getting uh, the, um, the aerated milk at the top and the, and the um, thinner milk at the bottom rather than the latte type steaming situation. I, I, maybe it is the technique I'm using, maybe I need to adjust slightly, but it's, it's just not making sense to me. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not sure why. Uh, generally, I, I find that foam incorporation is related to the temperature. <clears throat> so make, make sure that you've got uh, well, shearing force and temperature, sorry. Um, so just making sure that you're at three bar, <clears throat> hopefully with your steam to make sure that it incorporates it. Um, if the pressure goes too low, I find that the foam floats up quickly. Right, so I can't, I, I don't know that I can get to three bar. Um, I've, I haven't really played with the settings to try, but I'm typically around two bar, starting slightly I below. I think that that's very much the problem then. Uh, if you're at two bar, that's quite low. Um, so yes, I, what I'm wondering is if, um, the flow rate issues that you're experiencing, flow rate calculation issues with espresso are, um, also playing with your steam and that you're not getting the flow that the D1 firmware thinks you are. So I think possibly changing your settings, calibration, flow rate, and bumping it up a bit would be good. You should be in the three, three, two, three, five, uh, three, five at the end bar range, because you're in, you've got plenty of power. That's, that's what makes, John, that's what makes me think that maybe there's something deeper in the circuit. Okay. Maybe he's not getting the power that he should be. Is it, it yeah, he should anyway, be able to. Two hours. Let's, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, let's shut down the conversation. There were a bunch of questions about water, which I don't really want to cover because Water is um, a good diaspora topic, and, yes. and there's a lot of discussion about uh, remineralized, buying it, all that stuff. Uh, bring it up on diaspora, and people better than who are on this call can assist. All right? Thank you, everyone. Two hours is as much as we think we should do to this. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much. Bye.